this afternoon. So to all of those gathered and all of those who will trickle in, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's brown bag. Our presenter is Dr. Stanley Griffin, Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Masters Humanities and lecturer, soon to be senior lecturer as of August 1 in Archival and Information Studies in the Faculty of Humanities and Education in the Department of Library and Information Studies. Uh, Dr. Griffin holds a BA Honours in History and a PhD in Cultural Studies with high commendation both from the Cave Hill Barbados campus of the UWI, as well as an MSc in Archives and Records Management from the University of Dundee in Scotland. He's worked as an archivist for some 14 years um, at various archives and it is this archival experience which informs his research and publication um, in archives and records management and information studies. However, he has other research interests, including multiculturalism in Antigua and the Eastern Caribbean, and the cultural dynamics of intra-Caribbean migrations, archives and the constructs of Caribbean culture, and community archives in the Caribbean. He's had a number of publications. Um, it's kind of amazing to see the rate at which he turns out publications. Um, so definitely toiling onwards through the night is, the, is what he does. And so it is my pleasure to um, introduce him to give today's talk, which um, looks at a different sort of geography from what we've explored recently, where we have themes of culture and migration. Um, he's going to explore the spatial and cultural dynamics that occur when immigrants from the Dominican Republic play their home sport, baseball, on playing fields designed primarily for the game of cricket in Antigua and Barbuda. And so we will listen with eager anticipation for the presentation. Dr. Griffin, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Edwards, and thanks to Geography Geology for this opportunity. Um, as I said in my email with um, Dr. Edwards, it's not often that I get to speak cultural studies and to speak cultural studies with a twist focusing on perhaps geography of, of, of the culture. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, so today I will be talking about um, a part of my MPhil PhD work. In fact, while preparing for this, I realized that the, the paper um, that is the basis of this talk came out of my MPhil upgrade. So luckily I you know, was able to become a PhD candidate through this conversation. And uh, I'm focusing on landscapes, even though there are several aspects to the topic that we could talk about this afternoon. So my theme is Dominicano baseball on Antiguan cricket fields, and we're considering how landscapes um, are featured in this intra-Caribbean migration and the whole politics surrounding it. So briefly, I want to give you a quick synopsis of the history of Antigua and especially how it relates to migration. Um, Antigua is one of those, I think, especially in our Mona campus, it's one of those hidden um, open secrets of, of, of our region. Um, you know, Brian Dad in his, in his history of Antigua refers to the island as the, um, the unsuspecting isle. You know, it's, it's there with all these wonderful details yet somehow we all seem to miss it. And so we're gonna briefly spend some time on that history. Then we're gonna talk about how the immigrants from the Dominican Republic have created and crafted and cemented a space for themselves within Antiguan society. Again, sometimes right in your face, yet totally oblivious to, to, their, to the depth of their presence. And finally, we're gonna be thinking about how this works out itself in playing baseball on Antiguan cricket fields. So briefly, Antigua is the largest of the English-speaking Caribbean in the Leeward Islands, it's the largest island. It was colonized after St. Christopher 
which we now know as St. Kitts. And one of the reasons for the delay for, for the British to move into um, Antigua, what the indigenous peoples refer to as Wadadli, was one, there was no obvious water source, and two, there was a strong indigenous presence on the island and the indigenous gave them a run for their money. And so between fighting off the indigenous and being very concerned about the French, it took them some time to reach to Antigua. But once they settled in Antigua, once the British settled in Antigua, it became a hub for the leadership development and defense of the several island colonies, several British island colonies in the Eastern Caribbean, primarily taking over from that hub that Barbados was in the early 1600s. And so as the island developed, as the British presence developed, you know, it became central to how colonialism was crafted and operated or operationalized within the Eastern Caribbean. So once they moved, once they had that first settlement called Falmouth and the island was, you know, properly um, settled with a strong military defense, Falmouth, which is still there in the rural side, became less of importance and a town was designed. A strong town was designed and this design took place in the early 1700s with square grids. And we're gonna have a look at it just now. Again, Brian Dad talked about it having common features of the time that would be expected of a British town. And so you could actually get a sense from St. John's that there was a purposeful investment in the design and in, in, in the establishment of the British colonial presence there. And in 1843, when the big church, which was at that time, um, went through a hurricane, several damage and so forth, but a bishop for the subregion was, was ordained or you know commissioned. And once the Anglican bishop arrived, St. John's Church became St. John's Cathedral. And it, the literature says from 1843, St. John received city status. So it's very important to, uh, to, to, to locate culturally, politically, the island of St. John, the island of Antigua and the city of St. John, when we think about the inter-Caribbean migration. And I'll tell you why just now. So here is a 1788 map of the city. And quite frankly, we could spend the entire seminar just discussing um, the implications of this design, this map, this spatial use, because a lot of what took place in the 1780s kind of shape what is still happening in St. John's today. So if you could look for, you see this big church, if you could see my, um, yeah, if you could see the big church, the big cross there at the top of Church Street, Newgate Street, that's a cathedral and there is a dividing road. I didn't want to go into all these details. So if you can see my cursor, there's a Pope's Head Street, Newgate Street, Market Street. And that town, that those, those streets kind of subdivided um, St. John's into upper middle, working poor, and the upper elites. And you know, so when you see the cathedral going up further, you're you're actually going to be around spaces where colonial government uh, operated, the government, the governor general's house and so on and so forth. And we're gonna come back to this um, idea of St. John's um, when, we when we look at what's happening in our current day context. So Antigua became the governing presidency. A presidency is an island that is part of a federal, um, federal colony. And it became, it moved from, the, the governor moved from St. Kitts to Antigua in 1670, hopefully memory serves correctly. And then there was this, it became this federation having responsibility for the other surrounding islands, right up until 1871, when a formalized Leeward Islands Colony Act was, was enacted, which allowed for one governor, one Supreme Court, and one core of police. Each other presidency, St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla, they all had an administrator or a commissioner with a local assembly. And how it worked out is that local assemblies 
would have ordinances while the federal colony would have acts. And the federal responsibility would include the prison, the mental asylum, the currencies, and so on and so forth. What this simply means was that Antigua was always became a hub for the Eastern Caribbean, the Leeward Islands. Persons, it was commonplace for persons to come to Antigua for to come to St. John's in particular for schools, for medical care, for you know, um, commerce. I read an article some years ago about the library, how the library in that time period operated as a regional library, right? So persons came to use the facilities in Antigua as open from the, from the sub-region, which means when we look at the next slide, there was no closed borders, right? Persons could hop on a boat from Nevis, go to Antigua, and it were, you, were, you were considered moving within the colony. And so the idea of intra-Caribbean migration and, you know, um, Caribbean community has a different meaning in the sub-region than in other places that did not necessarily experience this open um, relationship. So we're now in the 1880s and by now you would have understood that Antigua would have gone through emancipation in 1834. They didn't bother with an apprenticeship system. And so by the 1880s, sugar was being developed in the Dominican Republic. And the Americans especially were trying to establish um, sugar plantations, but they needed experienced workers. The Haitians were not necessarily ideal for various reasons, including language and the, the, the regular opposition between, the regular contestation between Dom Dominicanos and Hispanic um, residents and the, the toxic relationship they have always had with Haiti. And so in the dead periods of sugar, sugarcane life in Antigua and the Eastern Caribbean, boats were commissioned by the Americans to sail through the Eastern Caribbean and bring workers to work on sugar plantations on the Southern coast. Um, yeah, Southern coast, I hope. I'm speaking to geologists, geography, so hopefully my directions are correct. Please forgive. So you would notice then that persons literally hopped on a boat and went to the Dominican Republic, all right? For the purposes of record keeping, they were not leaving the colony until they exited St. Kitts. So for the purposes of trying to document how many persons left, that never happened, at least in, I never found anything when I was doing the research from Antigua, but all the numbers were calculated from St. Kitts because St. Kitts was seen as the exit point. Now, initially this movement was seasonal, but as the sugar industry developed, um, the movement became permanent. And I don't want to spend too much time discussing that movement because it had implications on various islands. Um, one governor talked about, for Anguilla, for example, all the working age people for that, um, for that territory we left the Santo Domingo, all right? Um, the economy of the time, as much as it is not considered a, a, a successful migration period, the blue books reflect that remittances were high from the Dominican Republic. And so it was a, a migration that had serious um, repercussions or, or consequences or even benefits for the East, the Leeward Islands colony and in particular Antigua. Now, by the 1930s, the American involvement started to fade within the 1920s and the rise of Trujillo, the dictatorship, you know, came into being in the 1930s. And what Trujillo did was shut off the migration. So folks who would have seasonally moved between um, the Leeward Islands and the Dominican Republic by the 1890s, early 1900s, by definitely 1910s, they started to settle. And so in settling, there would have been a break in communication between those in the Leeward Islands and those who went to 
those who stayed in the Dominican Republic. This is important to note because in many family narratives, you will hear, oh yes, I remember an aunt, mostly male of course, but an aunt or an uncle who went to the Dominican Republic. And that is all the family in Antigua knew about, all right? And so <clears throat> heading into the 19, when they remained, when they settled in the Dominican Republic, they established um, enclaves around the sugar plantation. And so they kept their British English speaking um, culture alive in the Dominican Republic. Now I said British for a reason. The records would show the British open diplomatic relations with the Dominican Republic because the British West Indian workers or subjects demanded for certain rights on the plantation and benefits that the other blacks, um, the Haitians, for example, were not getting or even the, the, the Spanish speaking workers. They wrote to the governor stating that we are British subjects and the queen must send a representation. And so they had agency in this migration space to the point where uh, there are a whole host of legislative um, creative works trying by the various um, ordinances, local presidencies and the federal um, colony, trying to restrict the movement out of the, the various presidencies out of the Leeward Islands colony to the Dominican Republic. And once they were there, the British empire, as well as the Leeward Islands colony had to establish diplomatic relations with the Dominican Republic government to look after the rights of those who were working there. So interestingly enough, from a records perspective, the records between the, the, the British and the, the, and, the, and the Dominican Republic actually started in the late 1880s, early 1990s, or late 1880s, early 1900s, when the British West Indian workers demanded for representation. When they settled in the Dominican Republic, <clears throat> they obviously, as Rex Dutterford describes, you know, your cultural equipage, they took their culture with them. And to this day, this culture is definitely present in the Dominican Republic, referred to as Kokolo. One of the um, one of the explanations for that 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 term was the fact that um, some of the earlier migrants came from Tortola in the British Virgin Islands, and it became Tortola, Tortola, Cocolo, you know, through language. And so masquerade, music, culture, English language um, became a feature of, or a representation trait characteristic of the Leeward Islanders. In fact, one of the distinctives um, between community groups in the Dominican Republic, while the Haitians were French speaking and Roman Catholic, the Cocolos or those from the West Indies were English speaking and Anglican or Protestant. And so they established the Episcopal, what is now referred to as the Episcopal Church in the Dominican Republic. They walked with their foods. And so this, there's this example of Johnny Cakes being Yanni Kike. They established lodges and among other things, these are just some things I could fit on a slide and they played cricket, they played cricket on fields, on the sugar fields in the Dominican Republic. Most importantly for my purposes is they maintained family narratives. They, they maintained a memory of the Leeward Islands that would be useful to generations in the future when life reopened in the Dominican Republic. And so a lot of the coastal areas that were known for sugar plantations had a strong cricket presence. And with the American investment, because you know, the the equipments were playing cricket, the, the bat and ball and the pads were expensive to get and so on and so forth, the Americans invested in baseball. And so 
those areas are noted for strong baseball players, including the Sammy Sosas and so forth, um, whose you know, grandparents actually played cricket in the Dominican Republic. This is important to note because at the end of the Trujillo dictatorship in the 1960s, the Americans reopened their borders. The initial movement was to the USA, New York in particular. But then, you know, the difficulties economic wise started in the 1970s. The Americans, after all, started to shut their borders. Again, that initial movement were the educated, the upper echelons, those who were restricted university lecturers and so forth under the dictatorship. But once the border started to close, the migration um, target groups shifted to the working poor, right? Those who were not educated and so forth, and those who are the lower echelons of the of the Dominican Republic um, Republican society, and so in Antigua, the free zone economic um, work with factories, you know, stitching clothes and so forth, that opened up, and again for for the Dominican Republic, their pattern of movement is usually female led. So the mother or the wife would go first and then eventually the husband or the partner, and then children. And so they moved to Antigua in the 1970s, generally. There is a stigma um, of sex work. Um, that was a part of it. That has still stigmatized the community, but that was a part of their initial um, work in, 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 in the region. And once in the 1980s, once the American restrictions continued, the move increased because Antigua needed laborers. Now Antigua became independent in 1981, but more importantly, it was at this time generally that the idea of, I have family in the Leeward Islands. My grandfather or my grandmother came from X particular territory. And so they use this narrative, this, this memory to return. And in returning, they settled. Now, now, I've, I've heard of stories where persons landed at the VC Bird International Airport and they went straight to family plots, what we in Jamaica refer to family plots or locations of the family, knocking on the door and say, hey, I am your cousin, ex is your, and, and they rekindled um, family connections. So the family in Antigua would have cut off, knowing, yes, I have an uncle or an aunt who went but nothing more. While those in the Dominican Republic knew the grandparent generation and were able to reconnect. Now, some families were too shocked, they couldn't handle it and you know, they turned people away. Some other families welcomed and that reconnection and supported this remigration and supported their settlement in the island. And so those who were able to um, claim those narratives went by the National Archives, um, asked for the the birth certification of the grandparent and were able to claim citizenship through that very British um, traditional clause that if you could um, prove that your grandfather was indeed a citizen, you're entitled to citizenship, right? It was in the 1980s, more men rather than women started to arrive. So by the 1990s and early 2000s, when I did, when I started my MPhil PhD, there was, the numbers were increasing and there was this move towards crafting a community. Now, I wouldn't want to say it was a homage, you know, a united move. It was simply numbers were climbing and people were becoming, you know, vibrant with their cultural expressions, right? I can't discuss numbers right now because the numbers are skewed simply because those who claim to be Dominican Republic or the, um, from the Dominican Republic were only 2,369, if my memory serves me right. But on the street at that time, the general idea was that between 5,000 to 8,000 persons were actually from the Dominican Republic. Yet culturally, the vibrancy of their presence, you know, mirrored the 5,000, 8,000 versus that 239,000 um, figure. And so in the early 2000s, you started to feel their presence in, oops, in 
the carnival bands, Miss Kersey Riho Charles, who's pictured in the top right corner, it was the first um, carnival queen from the community. Established businesses, supermarkets that sold exclusive um, products from the Dominican Republic. They had money transfers, um, you know, mechanics, hairdressers, all of that. And they were very open and participated in participated in um, national events. For example, the carnival, there was news broadcasts, they had their own radio stations, they had um, liaisons in the various political parties. Um, if you go to a national office, for example, you go to the immigration office or you go to the Ministry of Health, there were signs in Spanish and so forth. So they became very much uh, uh, a strong force within the society, within the politics of the day. And so one of their expressions that you, know, you had to take note of was baseball. So literally that is how I came into the picture where I was doing this research and people were saying, but if you're looking at their churches, if you're looking at their business, you can't get away, you must look at their baseball. And so I met Kersey and I went, she was at the time leading the baseball association, the Little League Association, and I was invited to their meetings and so on and so forth. So a number of the pictures that you're seeing um, or you will see about you know, the game being played in the early 2000s were actually mine, it was my camera of the day. And you know, yeah, so here we are. This is baseball in Antigua on one of their Sunday afternoon practices on Rising Sun in the year 2006, the summer. Oh, for those of you who know Antigua, we're gonna talk about the significance of this particular playing field shortly, but it is on the outskirts of town. The brown buildings that you are seeing there is now the Lester Bird, they, they renamed the place. It's now the Lester Bird uh, Memorial Hospital. It was referred to as Mount St. John Hospital. And there's a white building you're seeing straight over the guy in blue with the, with the baseball bat. That's the Holy Family Cathedral, the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Cathedral. And I'm gonna show you another angle shortly where you will see what was the former parliament and now the halls of justice. So the game in Antigua started formally in the 1980s. At one point, there were at least three leagues. Now a league is set up of a bunch of teams um, that are coming together based on a particular criteria, perhaps location or age, right? But by, there was no support. So eventually those three teams, those three leagues, um, you know, Aided, and by the early 2000s, at least when I was showing, when I was doing the, the basic research, there was at least one. And that one, that one team, that one league got its paperwork officially authorized in the early 2000s, even though they direct, they were aligned with the American Little League Association from the mid 1990s. Initially, the sport was all male coming out of the Dominican, the Dominican community. Practices were in Spanish, even meetings. So the meetings that I attended, the parents spoke Spanish, the children spoke English. And if and when the director Kersey would say anything in English, the children would translate for the parents. So it was a very interesting dynamic to watch and witness. Um, and so the sport was used to reinforce cultural, um, the cultural nuances, dynamics from the Dominican Republic. It, that little change to include girls, folks who had an interest, classmates, for example, people who went to school with, you know, uh, uh, someone of who, who played baseball, you know, came and joined along. And by the time I came around, most of the members were between eight to 16 years old. I'm not too sure if that has changed, but I still, based on what I'm noticing, the emphasis is still very much on the young. Many of the players were born in Antigua to um, Dominicano parents, or they were naturalized, or they have Antiguan heritage. All right, so even if they were from the Dominican Republic, they were able to claim um, Antiguan heritage. And you'll notice that Antiguan heritage via the last name. 
So you would have a, a, um, a player could be named, for example, um, Juan Hughes. Hughes being a very strong Antiguan name. And so the baseball game is present in St. Kitts, Nevis, St. Martin, and the British Virgin Islands, right? Now, those territories are all territories that were a part of this uh, movement to the Dominican Republic. Interestingly, baseball is seen as an alternative to cricket in terms of the possibilities with playing baseball, um, sponsorship, um, scholarships, the ability to go to the US and so forth. So it is, even though it is a minority sport, it is a sport that has been quote unquote um, accepted as having potential given the fact that the community is large, the community has proven itself to be residential. I mean, they're not going anywhere. They're, they're set up stuck, right? And it, baseball has developed into the sub-regional Eastern Caribbean sporting activity. So in the summer, you'll find teams and around Eastern time as well, I think, hopefully, you'll find teams uh, moving around the region to play matches and so forth or for training and so forth. But the, the, for the purposes of this conversation, you know, the question is, where can they play? And so and we want, we want to think of the needs of baseball versus the realities of cricket. Now, ideally, these are, you know, without getting too technical, how the play is supposed to look. Cricket has a pitch in the middle of the, the, the land, and Baseball has a diamond at a corner. Well, to put the baseball diamond on a cricket pitch, it would mean that at some point, the cricket pitch becomes the outfield. Now, part of the problem with your pitch being your outfield is that the, the pitch, the guys who work out the pitch, because you know this pitch thing is a real science, right? I mean, I'm not into cricket that much, but there are um, groundsmen who, you know, for you to get the ball to bounce and all kind of thing, you have to know how to manage a pitch. And so part of the difficulty with allowing baseball to be played on the cricket field is chances are some people will be running up around or, or, or across, up and down on these people pitch, which is problematic. And so a lot of the politics surrounding using the, the, the cricket field is this very real um, concern about the purpose and of, of preserving the integrity of the pitch, right? And so, I want us to think back to that 1788 map <clears throat> and what a map of what the Taurus will get today online. Again, please forgive the very basic um, mapping here. So in the 1780s, right up throughout the ages, that area that is highlighted in blue was generally where migrants would first arrive. All right, um, the, the point area. And so when you should do a mapping of late 20th century St. John's, and when I mean late, from let's say from the 1960s, 70s come up, there were varying waves, right? Um, so when Jamaicans first landed, arguably, they landed in that area. When Dominicans from Rizal, the Commonwealth of Dominica, first landed, they end up in that area. Monstrations in that area. Um, Monstrations, even in the 1990s with the volcano, that general area. And so the Dominican Republic people, Santo Domingo, generally, that was the starting point. Again, they would have settled elsewhere eventually. But that area going from Pope St. Street going out onto Fort Road, yeah, that was generally the area. 
Now the two places within St. John's that were problematic or most ideal for playing are on the right hand side. You'll see two stars, one in blue and one in yellow, right? Even though memory serves, there is in that blue squared area, they are playing fields around. But the study, when I was doing it, focused the discussions on those two areas with stars. Now, the blue star is literally the Antiguan Recreation Ground. And if you know your cricket history, the ARG is literally, you know, the Mecca for Caribbean cricket. Right, it's a place where Lara Brian Lara made his 365 and has a long history. Now, I see a former student of the DLIS, Stephen Butters. He did his paper on trying to preserve um, the ARG as for his um, for his MA, and it's being published shortly. And you know, fascinating study where he talks about it being whites only, literally, it, it was a military um, parade right outside the governor general's house. And long story short, with the arrival of Cricket World Cup 2007 and beyond, the field lost its you know, central status. And for the most part is just staying, you know, I think it's abandoned. And I think Stephen Butter's work kind of validates that. Interestingly enough, uh, based on my notes, the Dominicana community found it very difficult to get access to this place for their baseball use. The grounds that you're seeing here is a short distance, literally you can walk straight down the road from the ARG. It's on the opposite end of the stretch. And it is a historically black sporting field. So while the ARG were you know, whites, uh, military whites and so forth, playing there exclusively for their cricket club, the Rising Sun was exclusively black. Um, there are no walls, there are no you know, benches. So the Dominicano uh, baseball players had easy access. However, even in my own presence, cricket playing took priority. So they would be practicing and a man would show up with, you know, hey, we're having a match now, and they literally had to clear out. So this issue of having space to play is problematic. Now, there are other two major spots. There is a Yasko, um, the Yasko Sport Complex, which is literally up the road <laughs> from um, the ARG. Now, according to my notes there, the, the Dominicanos used to play there, but again, very problematic not easy to get permission and you know if somebody else showed up for other activities their use was you know cancelled and since 2007 with the Sir Vivian Richard Stadium I haven't seen any reference to them having access or the ability to play there I stand in need of correction um so yeah I will answer that question, hopefully, uh, Cecilia Blake. So here's another view of the rising sun grounds. Um, that white building to the left is the present day halls of justice or the Supreme Court, the Eastern Caribbean um, court system. And the other building, that kind of pinkish, onto the right is the former House of Parliament. Uh, which is now a house of culture, I think that's what it referred to it. And the guys, you know, playing their baseball there on a Sunday afternoon. Now, since 2001, the community has been appealing to the government for a designated um, playing space. George King, you know, noted, and these are some newspaper reports that I captured um, these comments from. We have to stop playing baseball because somebody showed up to play cricket or football. You know, we need a place of our own. Now, in 2006, I interviewed the then Minister of Culture. Um, he has an interesting first name, but his last name was Adams. And he agreed that the community needed their own playing space. 
You can't tell people to come to your home and then tell them to be Antiguan. They come with their own traditions and culture and should be allowed to practice such. There are many cricket grounds in Antigua all over the place. I don't think people will object to it. We are seeing that the Dominicanos are here. So the baseball park is a recognition that we accept them and their culture. And this conversation took place in 2006. However, 2005, the government agreed to host the Latin American and Caribbean tournament at the Stanford Cricket Grounds. I don't think they call it Stanford Cricket Grounds anymore, but it's a sporting facility at the, at the um, airport. And I, I, I actually attended that as well. And so some of these pictures are mine. And Sir Alan Stanford is now, I don't know if he's Sir anymore, but he's in jail um, in, a, in the USA having um, been arrested for um, embezzlement and so on and so forth. But he was the mastermind behind the Stanford Cricket Ground. And in his speech refining there, he, you know, my notes said, when I, when I envisioned the Cricket Ground, I saw the English speaking Caribbean coming together for cricket. I never thought this ground could be a meeting point for both the English speaking Caribbean and Hispanic Latin America. The then prime minister in 2005, um, Baldwin Spencer was also there and he said the Dominicanos have added cultural diversity to Antigua, including sporting identity, having represented Antigua in tournaments around the region and Latin America. We will provide land for the erection of a baseball park to celebrate the contributions of the Spanish speaking community in Antigua. And the crowd went wild. Are you, as you're seeing, both gentlemen are talking um, with the help of an interpreter. And in the image, so the image, the, the top right-hand image is a sign that was placed outside the market area on the other end of town. And again, that sign is in total Spanish, advertising the sixth tournament. But on the day of the event itself, the day of the launch, the prime minister, Spencer, was Ceremonious, ceremonially pitching, that's the right term, the first ball to Sir Alan Stanford um, for him to bat. Now, if you understood the politics of race in the sport, at least in cricket, where it was the blacks who bowled and the whites who batted, you know, you kind of see where that the prime minister is perpetuating that kind of um scenario in, in, in the sport at the launch. But there, that is that. So in preparing for today, I realized that the community received land in 2008, in 2018, sorry, in the Potter's community, which is outside of St. John's. Now I was watching um, a discussion somewhere online and part of the issues they're having with this property is that it is away from the quote unquote majority of persons um, who are interested in the community. No, public transportation is not the easiest in Antigua, especially on weekends. So they talk about it being very difficult or expensive to, uh, to arrange for the guys to, you know, to, 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 to go to Potters. Secondly, they get the land, but there is no, there's still need, in need of funding um, to start construction. Plus, according to what I've read, this property is supposed to be shared with those who are interested in softball, which is, I guess, similar to um, baseball, but in other jurisdictions, I know if for Belize, softball was mostly led by women, at least at the time I was living there. So that's another, that's another dynamic that needs to be interrogated. So in terms of politics then, the game has been associated with governance in the sense that it has been an issue that has been part of the whole politics and how the political parties interacted with this particular minority group. Both political parties have used it as part of their electioneering anytime. <laughs> Up until recently, when they made some more adjustments to immigration laws, I was like, yeah, um, elections will reach. 
So anytime there is an election, there is this talk about inclus including, you know, making sure the other is, you know, according to Spence at the time, under this umbrella of nationhood and, you know, allowing for the full development and participation of space, of, 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 of sport, in especially baseball. And so this idea of baseball space has been a longstanding one, but yet there was no real effort. The other thing in terms of when we think of politics, we think of the, the interaction between people, it is caught in the whole social dynamics of cultural marginalization, right? It is not necessarily fully accepted. It is seen as the other. And some people refer to it as the Spanish people them game. And yet it is, you know, it is subordinate to the other sports that are on the island, especially cricket and football and their spatial or resources needs. Also, the game reflects the undocumented or unacknowledged dynamics or consequences of immigration and citizenship laws. And I put in quote, there, there's, the, the, it's unpopular. One of, the, one of the interesting things um, in Antigua, to my mind, is this question of where you're from. Right, um, it's almost one of the first things people now ask, you know, where you're from, um, what you're doing here, that kind of thing. And, and so there is this undercurrent dissatisfaction with the non-Antigon, not Antigon, and that expression that I, the, the, the that non antigua ness usually the first starting point is the accent. You know, hopefully you can still hear me, it's reading where I am. Um, and so there is this, you know, undercurrent dissatisfaction. And I think the sport is, I think the sport, you know, gets a bad rap or it's under resourced, it's, it's not fully. allowed to bloom because of this undercurrent um, dissatisfaction with, with all these various peoples that are now within Antigua. Yet, the game is thriving. Just last month, one of their, um, their players you know, signed a professional um, contract for the Boston Red Sox. And, you know, this guy, Ovos, Ovis, is seen as, you know, representing the potential of the sport on the island. The prime minister, it was a big deal. The prime minister met with the young fellow, noticed the young Antigon who now plays baseball. And so, you know, it's seen as the game taking root, yet lacking root, right? It, it, it's growing, yet still doesn't have a space of its own. So, Interestingly enough, the game has a history in the island, as a, you know, you can see here, the, oops, the, one of the coaches, their grandparents, you know, grandfather played the game in the Dominican Republic, and here he is in Antigua trying to establish the other game on the island. And so in terms of space, trying to play a game, you know, Sport is very much a part of how you see yourself culturally. And when you try to express yourself culturally, it, there is a clash. And that clash, um, that clash could be as tangible or as basic as give me back my field. It's time we have to play my cricket now. Now it's time to go. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I enjoyed it on so many levels. First, for the historical introduction to how um, Antigua um, emerged, um, its role in federation, the development of um, Falmouth and then St. John's. Um, how at first I thought I was missing something when you were dealing with the uh, migration to the Dominican Republic, but then showing how it set the stage for the migration back into Antigua. 
So all of that was really very rich. And then you got into the, the nuances of baseball and all that it represented in Antigua. So really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure as did others in the audience. Um, I know from earlier that there was a question posed by Cecile Blake, where she asked um, about your work and if you also explored the role of place names and geographical names um, in migration. I know you touched on some of it with like, um, I think if I'm gonna get it right and I'm looking on my notes um, when you referred to um, uh, Kokolo, um, the whole what was brought back and so on and some of the foods and the terminology but she had a question, specific questions about place names and geographical names and their role in migration. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that. It wasn't yeah, honestly, I haven't. Um, this, this, this study is one of those things. So first of all, because of my day job, initially I was in archives, doing archives, and then now I teach archives and archives and information studies the whole, you know, that is taking up my life right now. And so honestly, I haven't been able to delve into some of the other implications that the PhD study kind of expose. And that place name thing is, 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 is one of them. Um, simply because I do believe, as it has happened with other migrations, I mean, the British did it, the French did it. When they travel, they, they call people place, you know, names that they are familiar with. And I do believe in the Dominican Republic, there is some of that. I haven't heard any, and I don't know if Sir Prosper could jump, but I haven't heard any place names in Antigua being given Dominicano names, even, if, even as nicknames. I'm not aware of that. I may be wrong. Um, but I think that's something that's definitely in need of exploring. I, first of all, let me just say this. I think there's a history between the Eastern Caribbean and the other part, the other movements around the region, especially to the Dominican Republic, that needs a lot of work and that needs to be done. Now, let me close up with those so I can hear myself talking to you. Give me a few seconds. Thank you. Okay. Um, you're gonna play something or you're, you're all settled now? I'm good. All right. Um, I had a question. I mean, this work was a little while back. Um, have there been any real strides made in, on the promises of the integration for baseball and the creation of spaces for the playing of it um, since since that time? No, not that I've heard. Um, in, in preparing for today and going through newspaper articles since 2015, 2016, 2017, the same themes, same questions keep coming up. And notice that in 2005, 2006, the party that is now opposition was in government then, the opposition then is government now, and we, to my mind, things have regressed. So while, for example, in other spheres where the Spanish community had um, their radio stations, they had um, their news broad, a specific news broadcast and so forth, you know, they had persons at national events translating to my mind, all of that. Um, as far as I'm aware, all of that is now gone. That the, the, opposition upon winning, you know, cancel a lot of those advance, um, those advances that they would have made on the, what is the, the party that is the opposition. So it's an interesting, the only thing that ha they have remained, that, you know, have remained stable is this access to citizenship. And arguably that is for the purposes of voting, but anything else, you know, it's, it's all hearsay. In fact, I was actually surprised when on the Little League Association Facebook, they actually confirmed that they got this land in Potters. 
if my memory serves correctly, the, 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 the area that the community wanted was in point, which is within that blue square um, that, I, that I made reference to earlier. Now, had the community been given um, a particular, you know, a piece of land in the point area, that would have been more ideal because most of them generally, and I'm, you know, Sarah, you know, generally most of them live within that lower part of St. Charles. So it would be easier for them to have access and to develop. So I was intrigued by this, 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 this promise of land or this granting of land in the outskirts of St. John. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything that they want to ask or if um, Mr. Prosper has anything he wants to throw in as our local <laughs> in the house. No, um, nothing to say. Uh, uh, what it, what um, um, Dr. Griffin said is true. After a while, there was St. Johnson's Village, the last government, the, the UPP, the previous, when they were in power built, uh, I feel like, Johnson village area and they used to practice up there. That does not go on anymore. So basically what the doctor mm -hmm. is saying is true. Um, they're very invisible in the last couple of years, apart from the, the, the young man recently that got the minor league contract. Okay. Um, so, so, so Prosper, you think the politics of it is part to play or the community itself is not as, um, aggressive in its advocacy like in years gone by? I think the politics have a, a bit, a lot to do with it. And the community is not as aggressive as, as what, what, 10, 12 years ago in, 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 in trying to see themselves as a part of Antigua and Barbuda. They were, they were in everything, you know, all yeah. the sports, they were in everything. That, that is, is, is on the ground for the last you know, six, seven years. In terms of your reference to the archives, when I, I was there, I began to keep a check of course that came there trying to do what they call it, genealogy, lineage. And um, there were 237 people during the period, persons during um, 2007, between 2017 and 2018, when I was officially retired, that came seeking that kind of thing. They always seemed to, they, they knew who the names of the person, they knew the year, they knew like Mingo went back to 1847. Wow. And uh, another big thing, too, apart from the Dominican Republic, was Cuba. Towards yes. the end of my tenure, a lot of Cubans began to make contact. And I know the southeastern part of Cuba had a heavy Antigua and Barbuda present. Wow. And but I never did any research like you, Doc. I stopped there. And that, I need to follow up on that because I, um, well, my interest stopped at the Dominican Republic. They, I know the literature did say Cuba, but I, I didn't know it was as strong as you're suggesting. So that needs to be... Um, you see the whole Cuba thing, you know, people tend to think, and that's because the work has been done. The uh, Mike Barbados, um, Dr. Marshall is her last name, Sharon Marshall. She did a whole, she just published another book on the Barbadian Cuban connection. Um, people talk about Jamaica and Panama, um, you know, but the Eastern Caribbean had its own space, and that was the Dominican Republic, and I'm now here in Cuba, and so that needs to be investigated as well. You're not prolonging it, Doc, but I just cannot remember. When I went to the, I did go to the Dominican Republic. So I was intrigued. And there's a whole, a whole section, I can't remember the name in the Dominican Republic, that a lot of Antiguans and their relatives live. I mean, it was a, the Dominicans who, who he left here, married, went there, married again, had a set of children there, had some in Antigua. Um, you remember the whole movement, went to Cuba, trying to get to the US, and, yeah. and later on the Panama Canal. So the thing was to Cuba, and from Cuba went across the Caribbean to the Panama Canal. I just never followed it. It's just, it was a oh. story. So that needs to be followed up on. Thank I mean, I see Mr. Butts is on the line, so maybe he, he can share. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, Mr. I don't know. I'm not seeing any other hands. I'm, sometimes I miss them. Um, but for me, I like the multi-textured um, discussion that this talk brought up. And of course, it always 
as in all the best presentations, there are still some unanswered questions and it points to further work. Um, I do believe there was once a presenter at Elsa Gavaya lecture, um, Blackett, who said um, it's part of a larger body of work. So it's, no. it's part of a larger body of work, um, maybe not anything that you're actively doing, but it's there simmering. And so just to thank Dr. Griffin for his presentation this afternoon, very different, very refreshing. And um, he will know um, a promise made and a promise kept. Um, thank you very much on behalf of those who were able to attend. And I can assure you that there are others who actually catch the YouTube um, upload and I will share the link with you so you can direct yes. persons to the recording of the talk um, for the future for persons who may not have been able to have been present this afternoon. So thank you on behalf of the Department of Geography and Geology for your presentation. And as always, thank the audience, because then we'd be just talking to each other very quietly and we could do that without all of this. So thanks to the audience. And you know the faithful ones who turn up week after week. You know, I give you a shout out for your perseverance in listening to everything from geography and geology and in between. Um, so thanks. Um, I see a new face, Valerie Martins. I have I don't recall seeing you in the previous weeks. Welcome to this. The series. Valerie is a colleague from Curacao. She's a curator at the National Archives there. Uh, conservator, sorry, at the National Archives. So, welcome, <laughs> welcome. We will try to get your details. You can drop your email in, and we will add you to our mailing list to alert you to future brown bag presentations as we try to grow our community of scholars who listen to what we have to offer in the brown bag series. So, thank you all. And um, we look forward to sharing with you again. Um, we may have one more brown bag before we break for the summer. Uh, we'll let you know. Um, if not, it was certainly good having those of you who joined us during the past semester. Uh, so thanks to everyone and do enjoy the rest of your afternoon in whatever time zone you're in. All right, blessings everyone. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>